Healy with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Uh, we are very fortunate today to have a terrific panel of speakers um, who will be covering the topic of institutionalizing energy training on rural electrification. Next slide, please. Uh, before we get started, I just have one important note of, uh, to mention uh, before we begin our presentations, and it's a little disclaimer stating that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services, but the information provided in this webinar today is featured and will continue to be featured in the Solutions Center Resource Library as one of our many best practices resources that are reviewed and selected um, by our technical experts. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, just before we begin, also um, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. Uh, for audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or you can listen through your telephone. And if you choose to listen um, through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Uh, by doing so, you will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. Um, and I would uh, remind our panelists to also please mute your, mute your audio devices uh, when you're not presenting um, in order to, again, uh, eliminate feedback, echoes, and things of that nature. Um, and then uh, also one important note, if you're having any tech technical difficulties uh, viewing um, the presentation over the webinar platform, uh, you can contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826, and uh, they will be glad to assist you with troubleshooting any issues you're having. Um, if you would like to ask a question, we ask that you use the questions pane where you may type in your question. And if you are having difficulty viewing any of the materials through the webinar portal, you will find PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training. And you may pull those PDFs up and follow along as our speakers present. Also, I want to make you aware that an audio recording and copies of the presentations will be posted to the Solution Center training page within a few days, or within a few weeks, rather. So if you'd like to go back and review the presentations and listen to the audio recording, you may do so. Next slide. Um, we have a really great agenda prepared for you today. And again, this is focused on um, off-grid electrification and the edu educational aspects of developing uh, needed capacity capacity to install, service, and maintain renewable energy off-grid solutions um, and presented in a range of African contexts. Uh, as you can see, we have a very impressive group of panelists presenting on this topic. Um, and before we, uh, our speakers begin, I'm going to provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center initiative. And then following the presentations that our panelists will present, we will have a question and answer session followed by a very short survey to get your feedback, and then we'll wrap up with discussion and uh, closing uh, remarks. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide provides just a little bit of background in terms of how the Solution Center uh, came to be. The Solution Center is an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial, and it is supported through a partnership with UN Energy. Um, it was launched in April of 2011, and is primary le primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other SIM countries. Uh, outcomes of this unique partnership include support of developing countries through enhancement of resources um, on policies relating to energy access. Um, we provide no-cost expert policy assistance and provide peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, forums and training tools, such as uh, the webinar that you're attending today. Next slide. Okay, to go over a few things about the Solution Center, we have four primary goals. Uh, first, to serve as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. Uh, we also serve to share uh, policy best practices, data, and analysis tools that are specific to clean energy policies and programs. Um, the Solution Center delivers dynamic services that enables expert assistance, uh, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And lastly, the center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. Um, regarding our audience, uh, our primary audience is composed primarily of energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries 
but we also strive very hard to engage with the private sector, uh, NGOs, and civil society. And next slide, please. And so um, a marquee feature, I mentioned this just briefly, but a marquee feature that the Solutions Center provides is uh, our expert policy assistance. Uh, we call this service Ask an Expert, and it, it really is a valuable service offered through the Solutions Center. Um, we have established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are available to provide remote policy advice and analysis. And this is provided to all countries, and we offer it at no cost to the requester. Um, so, for example, in the areas of energy access and rural electrification, where this webinar is focused, uh, we are very fortunate to have Ellen Morris, who is from Embark Energy in the United States. And we also have Ibrahim Raymond from the Energy and Resources Institute in India. So that just gives you a little example of uh, some of the experts that we have on hand to assist in um, the particular area we're, we're discussing today. Um, but if you have a need for policy assistance on any clean energy sectors, we welcome and encourage you to uh, use this very useful service. And again, this, assist, this assistance is provided free of charge. And to request assistance, it's very easy. You may submit your request by registering through our Ask an Expert feature at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. And we also invite you to spread the word about the service to those in your networks and organizations. Um, again, some of the broad sectors that we cover include energy access, efficiency, renewables, smart grids, microgrids, transportation, and we also have a focus on regulations and utilities. Um, regarding how you can get involved, we encourage you to explore and take advantage of the Solution Center resources and services, including the expert policy assistance I just described. You may subscribe to our newsletter and, again, participate, continue to participate in webinars. Next slide, please. Uh, so now um, I'd like to just provide a brief introduction of our distinguished panelists. First, we have Rishinda Van Nguyen, who's Executive Director um, for the Energy and Climate Energy Access Initiative at the UN Foundation. Um, and following Rishinda, we will have uh, Christine Huro, Director of Training Support at Electricité de France. We'll, and she will discuss in t institutionalizing energy training for rural electrification and lessons learned from Mali and Burkina Faso. And next slide, please. Our final presenter is Dr. Harold Seisel, excuse the pronunciation. Um, and Harold wears a number of impressive hats, including serving as president of Seisel. Solar Energy, which is the Solar Energy Foundation, and he's also president of the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association. And Harold will speak to us about institutionalizing training for solar technicians and entrepreneurs and inform us on lessons learned from Ethiopia. So with those uh, brief introductions, um, I would like to turn the webinar over now to Rishinda. Rishinda, welcome. Thank you very much, and, and thank you again to um, everybody at the Clean Energy Solutions Center for hosting this webinar. For those of you who are joining for the first time, um, we have a, a, a good uh, cooperation with the Clean Energy Solutions Center, and um, for, uh, for other topics and subjects going forward, uh, we also welcome your input and your suggestions. Um, my name is Richenda Van Leeuwen. I'm the Executive Director for Energy Access here at the United Nations Foundation. Um, again, for those of you who may be joining us for the first time, UNF um, is very engaged in the United Nations and World Bank Sustainable Energy for All initiative um, in various aspects, um, particularly in terms of our contribution around energy access. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, we are focusing um, uh, in the work that I lead on uh, helping to reach the 2030 objective around ensuring universal access to modern energy services. Um, that includes an electrification component. It also includes access to clean cooking services. Um, in 2011, um, as part of our commitment and our support of the Sustainable Energy for All initiative, next slide, please. Uh, we launched the Energy Access Practitioner Network. Um, 
We've had very rapid growth of this network, which focuses specifically on looking at the contribution of decentralized mini or microgrids um, and off-grid uh, electrification solutions and energy services towards uh, contributing um, to the overall global objective of achieving universal energy access by 2030. Um, we have members now, we have 1,200 members drawn from 191 countries. Um, they range from startup uh, companies, some of them are venture-backed, all the way through to uh, large utilities like Electricité de France um, uh, joining us today. Uh, we have uh, members across the supply chain from manufacturers um, through distribution and installers um, in very local settings as well. Um, so we have a very eclectic group of membership. Um, we are technology agnostic. We are looking, clearly there's a, um, a strong uh, push towards using um, cleaner and clean energy solutions wherever possible. So we tend to focus more um, particularly on renewable energy contributions towards achieving energy access. Um, uh, but across, we work across the spectrum and uh, um, many of our partners are engaged in, um, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. We have strong membership in many different countries in sub-Saharan Africa. We're represented currently in 46 countries in, in Africa um, and hoping actually to have uh, representation in, in every country in Africa um, in the coming months. We really focus primarily on market-based and market-oriented sustainable energy applications, um, particularly, as I mentioned, focusing on mini-grid and off-grid solutions um, and looking at how we can be developing sustainable um, solutions and sustainable energy services that really benefit communities and households and consumers. We are focusing particularly on the adoption of appropriate new technologies. We advocate around um, supportive regulatory and policy environments, both for off-grid and mini-grid solutions. We focus on innovative financing and business models and really look at a dissemination of best practices. So today's webinar um, has been organized uh, by us really looking at this dissemination of best practices, particularly around the complementarity of the, and the need for um, an educational approach to the work that we're doing um, outside of or, or very closely tied to um, the actual distribution and installation, operation and maintenance of these solutions, and we'll get to that in a moment. The Energy Access Practitioner Network operates as a network of networks. Um, we work in collaboration with many different uh, regional um, entities such as the African Renewable Energy Association. Um, we work with uh, uh, partners drawn from all over the world and uh, part of the work that we're also doing is, is sharing um, uh, many, many lessons um, that we have learned as a sector trying to help um, disseminate them globally where relevant um, in different contexts. So um, not everything will be relevant to everybody, but we're really also trying to look at some of the best-in-class uh, best practices and help to um, disseminate those uh, in, other, in other contexts where others may be struggling with some of the same issues. Next slide, please. Um, it's specifically around training, um, we have been focusing in the network on um, standards and uh, um, in uh, writ, writ, writ large, um, we have a working group that has been particularly focused on standards um, and this webinar in part was drawn out of the work of that working group. Um, when we talk about standards, we've been looking very much at product quality, at installation quality, and some of you may well have joined us recently for the webinar that we hosted on the International Electrotechnical Commission's um, standards and looking at some of the new standards that have just been issued for um, both product design of solar lanterns but also around installation and implementation um, areas. But we're also very much focusing on standards in terms of the human component and the capacity building of the people on the ground, the folks on the ground, whether they are the ones who are installing systems, whether they are the ones who are maintaining systems. 
One of the things that we see still across the sector, unfortunately, in many countries and many contexts is something of a struggle um, to be able to ensure that you have well-trained technicians, um, ensuring that the human uh, element is, um, the, whether it's electricians, whether it's community members, whomever is tasked to be able to uh, maintain the system over time, um, has the requisite skills and knowledge and capacities to be able to do that. You know, we're looking, when we're looking at a solar panel uh, installed, we're looking at a 20-year plus solution set, and we need to be able to ensure that um, we can maintain the, 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 the solution, install it properly, and maintain it over time. And for those of us who have been in the sector for a while, we, we recognize that with the best will in the world, unfortunately, there's a lot of variety in quality um, around the installation and maintenance of these solution sets. And at times, that has actually undermined um, the, uh, the outcome and the experience, because sometimes projects have not been sustainable simply because um, it's fallen apart at the, at the level of, of the capacity and ability to maintain those solution sets. So we're really working closely with a range of, of, um, of uh, practitioners, and today it's really practitioner-led, but um, with the example of what a large uh, international utility has been focusing on, and then also um, what a smaller SME and nonprofit organization has been focusing on, and in fact very much how they've intersected which has been looking at the, the need to be able to incorporate um, training and competences into the core curricula of the countries where they are operating. Again, we, we, we strongly support training programs that occur at the local level, but ultimately the best way to build capacity in a country context is to ensure that it's embedded in that national curriculum, whether it's in a vocational training school, in this country it would be a community college, uh, whether it's through apprenticeships or whether it's through some sort of diploma, whether it's training electricians that are already certified or really helping to be the first um, point of contact for, for training for a specific area. So um, I'm very excited to have um, two uh, presentations um, focusing on different parts of Africa, one particularly in East Africa, uh, one drawn from West Africa um, today. Um, what we'd really like to do as well is think about more, more generally um, the applicability of these uh, examples in your context, in your geography. Um, to what extent is there already engagement by ministries of education at the national level or perhaps some um, municipal educators at the regional or local level. Um, we know that there is a lot of work going on around the world um, in training, but again, it's also looking at uh, solving other issues along the way, particularly, as we know, um, in many, many geographies, very high youth unemployment, and looking at how we can be integrating that educational piece and also solving another problem along the way, which is providing opportunities for youth employment. So without further ado, I'm delighted to turn this over to uh, Christine Ura from um, EDF, who will give us some examples from uh, Mali and Burkina Faso. So Christine, welcome, and thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, thank you also for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to share the, well, the, the small experience we, we have now uh, through a project I will present to you. Just uh, as a, a very short introduction, uh, I will present myself, so I am uh, uh, in charge of capacity building and training in the international development of EDF. EDF being, uh, let's say, the uh, one of the largest um, uh, utilities, electricity utilities uh, in Europe and uh, even in the world, and uh, being also committed to, uh, through its corporate, and corporate social responsibility program, to access to energy, and this uh, since uh, the mid, mid of the 90s. So it means that we have uh, gathered uh, quite a, a well, a big amount of experience on uh, on this access to energy programs, mainly in Africa, um, and uh, it was through this uh, process, through these different programs, that uh, we noticed the, the need 
to uh, develop capacity building programs because uh, although we had the money and we had all the technologies to uh, create some uh, rural electrification services companies uh, in, uh, in Mali, in uh, South Africa, in Morocco, uh, then in Senegal and now in Botswana, we noticed that the progress was not uh, the improvement of the uh, of the access to energy was not as fast as we uh, we had hoped uh, at the beginning, and uh, as one of the big uh, um, reasons we noticed and we heard from the operators was the lack of uh, capacities and of uh, competencies from uh, from from all the different uh, uh, players. Maybe we can go just to have the context of the project to the next slide, please. After, next, next. And uh, yes, even the next one. Thank you. So um, as I told, we had uh, a, a very long uh, uh, survey on this different uh, on this uh, on this need of uh, competencies. It's uh, ob ob although it seems to be obvious today, it was not at the beginning, and we were. We, it took quite a long time for us to identify this uh, real uh, fundamental need, and it was expressed to us not only from the, the through the operators, uh, but also through the ministries and through the agencies for rural electrification. And uh, uh, so for us, we, we just to confirm and to, to be sure that uh, there was really something to do in that uh, direction, uh, I organized different surveys and different seminars, and it all uh, just pointed out that it was really a crucial need and that we had to work on this uh, with a high priority. So uh, next, um, yes, thank you. Uh, the, also, the reason the reason why we had to uh, to work on this was that we we really uh, very uh, well analyzed the benefits for different families of players on this uh, on rural electrification. Of course, the different operators who express the need because they would like to recruit and to train their staff, then they would like to uh, qualify, the, to have qualified officers immediately operational, which is uh, not always the case. And uh, they also want to enhance quality services and then, and, and, and then to uh, ensure efficiency and profitability in their activity, which is really a, a very, uh, the very first condition to be uh, sustainable and to be, uh, to be op operational. The countries themselves, in, who are in, which are involved in rural electrification programs, they want to ensure better chance of success for their policies, and they also are more or less aware that uh, there is a, a big potential of uh, employment uh, through this new activity. Uh, we estimate that uh, about 100 direct jobs are linked for uh, 10,000 customers. And uh, they also want to anchor sustainable development in rural areas, and this won't be possible unless the rural uh, electrification programs are made with uh, well, professionally. The schools and training centers also um, express a very, uh, very high interest because they understand all the interest to rise in competence, to enhance the qualifying new sector of activity, and to extend their activity and strengthen their act attractiveness. The NGOs we are working with and different consultants, equipment manufacturers, also um, say that uh, improving the, um, the capacity building and training in that field would give them a clear framework to propose their own offering. And of course, all the funders and investors for uh, rural electrification programs know that if there is a, big, a better qualification, they will, have, uh, they will secure their investment, they will have a better visibility on complementary, uh, complementary support to consent, and they will they know that uh, all the, the part of this the, the investment they need uh, should be dedicated to um, uh, what to to this uh, uh, secure, security of the project so now maybe uh, next slide i will uh, go and i, I will uh, 
present you what the initiative we had uh, through the uh, uh, the impulse of the um, uh, of the union, the European Union. Uh, the European Union launched uh, end of 2009. Um, a tender for proposal concerning rural uh, electricity access to energy program and uh, there was a part of this program which could be dedicated to uh, training uh, projects. So we decided to, um, uh, you see the logos of the different partners, uh, well financers of the European Union, you have the three logos of EDF, AMADER and uh, FDE and and to IE, uh, maybe just to uh, to the next uh, next slide, you can see the different. They are the partners of uh, of this uh, project, the main partners. Uh, the duration is of three years, and we started in step September 2011. So until uh, we have to uh, to work until two, uh, September 2014. And uh, um, we decided to focus on two pilot countries because otherwise it, it could have been uh, uh, a little bit too uh, too ambitious. And which we we choose, um, which we have chosen Burkina Faso and Mali, uh, mainly for for the reason that uh, these countries first are quite advanced in their rural electrification program, and uh, second because we knew particularly well. Uh, the different um, entities and uh, operators in these countries and uh, uh, we wanted to be sure to make sure that uh, we could work quite uh, efficiently and uh, and already with uh, with well identified uh, partners we have also several associates with the the, um, the French uh, agency for uh, uh, energy efficiency and environment ADEM we have an NGO, which is uh, Electricien Sans Frontières, and three uh, rural electrification uh, services companies who are very important for us because they are, the, let's say, the, the people uh, to whom the project is dedicated. So we wanted to make sure that we have around the table people who are able to tell us this is useful for me or this is not really the priority for me. The support in each country is mainly um, given by the Ministry of Secondary and Higher Education and by the Ministry of Professional Training. This in close cooperation, of course, with the Ministry of Energy, but let me point out the fact that the Ministry of Energy is rather, let's say, the, the client, the customer of this program, and uh, uh, the ones who are really working with us and, uh, and uh, making the program uh, possible and effective are uh, the first uh, the first two ministries I have I have quoted. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, what let's let give let give me um, the the main uh, characteristics of the of the project. First, uh, the lead is really given to local actors and decision makers. Of course, uh, EDF is a, let's say the, the pilot of the of this uh, this big project, but we are really relying upon the uh, local energy uh, rural electrification agencies, about the ministries, about the NGOs and the operators, and uh, we are just more more or less helping them to express their needs and to uh, organize the uh, the projects but uh, we never interfere with what they tell us is priority for them. The second point is that this is a competence-based approach. Uh, we, want, we didn't want to, uh, to apply a model made, uh, made, let's say, made in Europe or, uh, or elsewhere. We just wanted to understand and to, to identify and to prioritize the needs of the local people developing these uh, uh, access to energy programs and to enhance and complete the available offer, uh, not to substitute. But uh, And then the, the other point is that all the work on the curricula and contents of training um, is giving priority to short and practical training. Uh, because it's also the point we have identified as uh, a, a, the, the big necessity. It's not we don't need in a, in a big majority engineers or uh, high, highly qualified people. The mass of the employ uh, of the employees we need for this uh, access to energy program is rather made by uh, a low qualification but very good trained people. 
the priority we we are giving also is to training uh, uh, the teachers and the trainers themselves. Also, to uh, it, it's a question of efficiency, and uh, it uh, it is for us very important to uh, uh, to have locally the people when the project will stop will uh, will be finished that uh, the trainers are in place and well uh, trained to uh, to be able to give the, to deliver all the uh, the competencies needed and then we give priority to the long to long term through contracting with the government bodies uh, and uh, and avoiding as much as possible too uh, limited and too uh, punctual uh, uh, actions uh, in the next slide you will uh, you will see the four commitments we have um, uh, we have uh, taken with the European Union. Uh, the first one is uh, AFR is meaning results. The result number one to be achieved is to identify and to prioritize the need, meaning to in, to, in, to make the inventory and evaluating and to eva evaluate, excuse me, the existing offering. Uh, I will just um, uh, develop this uh, a little uh, a little bit later. The second point is to create and to re to, to to make a catalog uh, and to make it available to all the operators and agency so that the uh, the offering in the capacity building and training programs are really um, accessible to everybody. And then we, uh, uh, the result number three should be to carry out test training and to implement a certification process on the, um, on the, on the work we are doing. And for, uh, the, the, the fourth point is to uh, disseminate and to replicate the action in other countries in Western Africa first, but also even uh, in other parts of Africa or maybe elsewhere in the, in the world. So then in the next uh, next slide and okay so first point identify and prioritize the training requirements it makes uh, sound silly but uh, when we started the project we noticed that nobody knows exactly what are the different jobs and capacities needed uh, to be a good operator in rural electrification or to be a good legislator in rural electrification all what has been done uh, previously was rather, let's say, pragmatic and, uh, uh, well, step by step. But nobody had really identified and make, made a list, let's say, of what should be, um, uh, what should be implemented as a, a kind of jobs for, uh, to, to, to perform in a rural electrification. Um, so we have uh, specified all these capacity needs and skills. We have done this with the operators, with the rural electrification agencies, with all the professional uh, sector uh, concerned by this activity. And then we have established a kind of description. You can see that in the next, uh, in the next uh, slide. You can see a kind of, sorry, it's in French, but uh, uh, through this kind of uh, uh, of paper, we can exactly know what is the job, job job function, what are the competencies required, and of course, it's very helpful to know who is for people who are interested, for example, by joining uh, a rural electrification activity, what kind of jobs uh, they could um, they could take and or make, and to do this what kind of qualification they should uh, they should obtain in the next uh, in the next slide uh, you have the uh, the big functions we identified three types of functions and jobs uh, and we have described them and they correspond to the main functions required to operate rural electrification uh, it is more or less exhaustive as um, uh, you as you know it's not uh, a a very, very wide range of capacities that are needed. We identified a scope of, uh, of functions in the generation for the generation activity, then for the distribution activity, and for management and support to the management. And this is organized in four skills families that, are, that we have selected, depending on the type of electrification. We have sites electrified by diesel generators, and I must say that in Africa, it's still a big majority of them. 
Uh, we have sites electrified by individual solar kits, sites powered by hybrid systems, uh, diesel and solar in most uh, most cases and this part is really growing very very fast and we have also interconnected sites which are quite remote from uh, from the uh, uh, national grid but uh, uh, which have already um, uh, which are uh, nevertheless connected and uh, it is another uh, another approach which we have to uh, uh, to uh, to take in, uh, to take in consideration we also have identified future skills required for adapting uh, technical innovations, for example, with biomass and biofuel increasing. So we have anticipated this and already described different kinds of jobs that should be related to this, also to be in order to, uh, to, to prepare to these different skills. So with this kind of map, let's say, of the of the uh, what what does it mean being uh, active, uh, being uh, um, operator in rural electrification? Uh, we have uh, now a, a good uh, orientation and a good possibility to explain to people in which categories they could get their job or in which kind of uh, competent to which kind of uh, competencies sh they should uh, they should develop uh, themselves. Next slide. Um, corresponding to this uh, to these needs and to the jobs, we had to identify who is able to deliver this um, uh, this capacity building and training of vocational training. So uh, I would like to to repeat that uh, we aimed at working with existing schools and uh, institutions and at in enhancing their competencies, not at creating new uh, new schools. First, because we are not sure that it would have been uh, um, uh, sustainable, uh, we would have need uh, uh, more money, which was not, and more time, which was not compatible with the duration of the project. But uh, we also are aware that all these uh, schools existing, technical schools existing in the different countries, are uh, or could be uh, could be um, adapted. Uh, to respond to the to the the jobs we have uh, to the needs of jobs we had identified, so we have um, uh, established a big uh, let's say a big documentation uh, uh, work and the documentation fact sheet uh, has been established and sent by the ministries to the different schools and institutions to motivate their commitment, and you will see on the next slide that uh, we have now. Um, uh, these are the different uh, the different formulas we asked uh, the schools to uh, to f to fill up, and um, so we have been able to create a catalog in both countries in Mali and Burkina Faso about where are which schools uh, able to um, deliver which kind of capacity building uh, training uh, for which kind and which which could lead to a job in rural electrification. Um, the next, in the next uh, slide, we also wanted to uh, adopt uh, me an evaluation methodology, uh, all, always in agreement with the actors and ministries the concern, just to write to, re to write the specifications, and also to um, well to to work on a very uh, very concrete and operational ways with pilot institutions. What we decided once more it's we, we avoid uh, all theoretical work. We want to, to work on on the field and with the schools and with the operators and that's why in Burkina Faso it will uh, it will be done in Mali in the next uh, uh, in the following uh, next month. Uh, but in Burkina Faso we have already uh, selected six six pilot institutions from different uh, levels and in different regions and uh, with these pilot institutions we will train their trainers, we will see what kind of uh, pedagogical tools and equipments they need, we will implement with them training sessions adapted to rural electrification and we will elaborate uh, also a public relation policy toward the families and local authorities because we have noticed that uh, people are not really aware about the opportunities of job uh, offered by this rural electrification program. So we also have to communicate about, uh, about this. Maybe I will go directly to the over next 
slide because uh, as you will get the um, uh, the slides will uh, you will have the opportunity to see the different uh, uh, documents and uh, uh, working paper we have uh, we have um, uh, we have created um, we have been able to uh, launch uh, mid of April the first paper catalog of the uh, of the, the, the schools existing we have already registered 32 training centers in Burkina Faso and 13 for Mali and we know that uh, um, altogether there are 55 training centers in Burkina Faso and 35 in Mali so within uh, until October we should be able to complete our catalog and to uh, to fulfill all the range of different establishments uh, um, uh, of different uh, schools existing in uh, in both countries and uh, as we are trying also to be uh, a little bit modern we have created our site uh, a, web, a website uh, you see the um, the address uh, at the, uh, on the on the slide, and you will be able to uh, well to, to connect you if you wish, and you will see all the rounds of data already gathered on this uh, on this uh, website. Concerning next slide, the the, the the test training and the implementation of the certification uh, process. We have already been able to train uh, to make training sessions. Uh, during uh, 260 days in Burkina Faso for 70 uh, trainees and mainly we started with maintenance of diesel generators with uh, solar and PV and with management and administration which is also very very important um, thinking about rural electrification we we automatically think about all the technical work but we shouldn't uh, underestimate the importance of being able of uh, uh, making a budget having a commercial activity making management of the different teams and so on it is really really crucial and the operators are uh, very often um, uh, well in in, in uh, uh, needing help for this because uh, it's even more difficult than the technic technolo technical aspect for, for them. Our method uh, in our work we systematically evaluate the, uh, the, the training sessions um, directly at the end of the session and six months after just to make sure that what the people have learned is useful on field and uh, so we, we go and ask them and we, uh, it also helps us to improve the content of our own uh, curricula so it's very very important for them and we do this systematically and uh, we also have contracted in Burkina Faso with Sonabel which is the, um, the electricity utility, the national electricity company in this country because we want to make of, uh, of this uh, Sonabel a regional center of excellence for, for rural electrification and um, so it means that the national electricity company should be able and is already in, in several fields of activities and for different kinds of jobs is already in a position to deliver a very good qualification uh, and training programs uh, directly useful for rural electrification and we also have contracted with the NGO a local uh, NGO uh, called Tintua in Burkina Faso this NGO is um, operating for illiterate people and giving sessions in local languages and maybe we, it will be uh, maybe we can uh, we can discuss this uh, in, the, in the debate, but uh, it's also something we have di discovered on field, how important it is to, um, to be able to deliver all the uh, programs in local countries because uh, not all people are able to speak uh, French or, or English and uh, we have to adapt to, this, um, uh, to these people. For um, next slide, uh, we have um, for initial training, uh, my previous slide was on professional training and vocational training, uh, the, this one is on initial training, we have signed agreements with the Ministry of Higher Education in Burkina and also with the Ministry of Youth and Vocational Training and Employment and with both of them we are working on curricula which are really in 
included in the national syllabus so that we are sure that it will be more or less forever. It will be updated, and uh, we, uh, but we are sure that when we stop the project, it will remain in the curricula and uh, the national curricula. And um, and this is uh, with uh, uh, with uh, the Ministry of Higher Education in book uh, we have uh, adapted. Uh, CAP with CAP is a low qualification for electrotechnic, and we have adapted this to rural electrification. For the Ministry of Vocational Training, we have we will uh, we have started. Uh, it was we have started on this Monday of this week to create from from scratch a training program specifically dedicated to rural electrification, which would be operational beginning of next year. So next slide uh, maybe uh, and even even next slide because this we can maybe come back to this uh, during our discussion on uh, the replication and uh, uh, dissemination of the of the project but uh, we um, I would like to to, to point out uh, so, some unexpected challenges to overcome because maybe I, I, I give you the impression that it's or it, all is very smooth and going very uh, very easily, which is not uh, not always the case. And uh, I think uh, we we are thinking uh, more uh, more precisely. We are thinking about uh, some difficulties, and uh, we would like to improve on this. First, insufficient available data on the offering on the different countries. It's very very difficult to uh, to obtain all the uh, of all the information. Uh, second, necessity, necessity to, adapt, to adapt training to illiterate and non first business trainees. I always mentioned, uh, already mentioned uh, this. And also the capacity to quickly mobilize quick, uh, quick actors. Uh, just to, to, um, uh, to, 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 to summarize, uh, when, when we come back, maybe next, uh, next slide, uh, I would like to, uh, to say that uh, the, well, we we have we are not we have not finished this uh, this project. We are just uh, uh, we have made uh, half of it. Uh, but already I can tell you what uh, uh, what could be uh, uh, disseminated and, and shared with the different uh, different countries and different also, uh, people interested by this. Um, all what has to be in the next, please. The, all the methodology and all the data are available and uh, transportable without major investment. The skilled jobs identification, the evaluation uh, method of training institution, the website, all of this exists and uh, can be shared tomorrow with, uh, with all the people interested in this, uh, in this uh, project. Next, uh, next slide uh, will show what is existing and would need to be adapted, but without any, uh, without giving a very big amount of efforts and, and money. This is, for example, all the methodology involving the different uh, actors, decision makers, and operators. Uh, all the agreements we have signed with the different governments. This is also a basis which could be adapted, but uh, you you don't have to uh, re create the wheel, you can, uh, it would be really, uh, really e easy to, uh, uh, to, to adapt this. Um, then the next slide, uh, what should be created for, for and could, be, could not be really replicated, uh, deals with all the identification country by country of the actors, the decision makers, the uh, schools existing and so on, but uh, um, uh, once more, the methodology to identify all this and to create, for example, the catalogs and to uh, uh, to complete the, uh, the website. This is also uh, uh, this is also um, very easy to. Uh, uh, you, well, we don't need to to start from uh, from zero. And as a conclusion, uh, the next uh, slide would be and the final. Exactly. Thank you. Would be just to, uh, if you remember, I have listed all the uh, interests of all the, the different uh, players, and now benefits for all mean also means also commitments for each, and uh, it means that we have to follow up. You will take time to uh, to read the slide, maybe more precisely, 
uh, afterwards. But uh, I think that uh, we should think about uh, how to improve the methodology and how everybody should commit to this kind of uh, programs. Uh, not only con not always considering that uh, it's uh, well it's given it's for free and uh, we have to uh, uh, well to take the benefit from this but we also have to be uh, proactive to gain uh, skills and to uh, uh, well to to be to secure a sustainable and an efficient methodology uh, for the benefiting countries uh, which are not only in Africa once more. Thank you very much for your inter att att attention. Sorry. And thank you very much uh, to Christine. This is Richenda. So um, for that uh, excellent presentation, we'll now move on. Um, and uh, Harold Schulzweigel will be uh, giving us his presentation from uh, East Africa. Thanks, Harold. Thank you, Richenda, and uh, also Christine. Uh, it's really a very interesting, interesting uh, presentation you made, and it's a huge work you you are doing. Ours is a bit uh, smaller, and um, I, but I hope it's it's also interesting. Um, the the work or the country we have started with our work was Ethiopia. Now we are working in Kenya and Philippines as well. And uh, we are working as a foundation together with um, companies because we think that donation money from a foundation should be used to initiate a local solar business. And the best success for a foundation is to become, to become uh, superfluous, to say uh, no longer need for a foundation. When we started, we found several um, nice pictures and this shows us why we really need to have um, to have um, training for technicians not only uh, product information a product information you easily can get let's say you have a solar lantern and then uh, you read the product manual and then you know what 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 the lantern can do. But if you really think about sustainable energy supply, you need a good technician. And here you see what happens if the solar panels are not really proper mounted. Or what we also found very often is that um, everything is there, but nothing is working because there's a conflict of interest between environmental protection and um, solar energy. And another thing we found is that sometimes um, technicians think a panel is a panel and it doesn't matter in which direction um, the cells are um, looking. Or what you mostly or very often can find is that there is an installation, but um, you, you can be sure this doesn't work very long and it's not really healthy for the end user. So finally, um, what we do in Ethiopia or since 2004, and um, that's just one slide, but I think it's important for your understanding which type of training we are doing. Um, we installed up to now more than 20,000 uh, solar systems and we provide end-user financing. We have our own microfinance institution in, in Ethiopia, so we do end-user financing, but we are focused from first day on customer service, maintenance service and end-user training. That's why we established, that's why we established 14 solar centers in rural areas. In each solar center we have four or five solar technicians and one finance guy and this ensures that we are really close to our customers. We are now um, in around 83 villages which we permanently support with, with energy. We install light in schools and in health clinics. Okay, that's the standard uh, program of, of an NGO. Um, but with this approach, with financing, technology, training, um, customer service, 
you have to think holistic. Um, and it doesn't matter from which point you start, all points are connected. Today we are thinking about our training institute, which is called International Solar Energy Institute. So if you think about training, then you also have to think what's after the training. If you train technicians, um, then they are hopeless or frustrated if they have no chance to get a job or to start their own business. That's why we train only if we can provide uh, startup financing and startup support for the technicians we train. So finance is immediately included for the time after the training. Also you need a technology which is uh, not cheap but has to be risk-free and durable. You need to ensure that your technicians and um, your engineers are really customer oriented, which is sometimes for technicians um, a challenge because they are more technology oriented. So you have to think about your customers need and what they need. And last not least, you have to do a proper management of your uh, overall uh, activity. The training part in, in our network started 2007 as a department of our Ethiopian uh, Stiftung Solar Energy, Solar Energy Foundation, we are focused on vocational training. We are not interested and not focused on university level. That's another approach, another work which we don't want. We want to train technicians who are interested to go in rural areas, stay there and install solar systems. Our main course is a course which is um, called Rural Solar Energy Technician. It consists of three modules, which is solar technology, of course that's clear, it's a six weeks um, theory course. Then also management, it's also a theory for six weeks. Um, this does mean the bookkeeping, how to manage a small enterprise, what about end-user training, what about thinking for end-user service or how to manage end-user finance. This is for, for a solar business in rural areas uh, very important that you are, you are also informed about the management. And then after this we do a practical training in our own work in our own network and this takes about three months. So totally this training has a duration of six months which is very very long of course but after these six months you have really like-minded and uh, engaged technicians. We find these students in uh, TVETS, which are vocational training institutes in Ethiopia. We don't do a basic training in electricity, that's why you have to pass an entrance exam uh, on three topics. One is you have to solve some, uh, some uh, questions or answer some questions about electronics and uh, electricity to show that you have, uh, have these skills. Second, you need to know um, computer because that's important to manage your, your business and the third is you need to speak English because a lot of uh, manuals and training books are in English written. We designed after two years practice and experience, we designed a curriculum which is about 1000 pages um, and when I say we then I mean I do mean our Ethiopian engineers and trainers because these are the experts, the Ethiopians. No white colored guy or woman is, is there. Uh, it's a training from Ethiopian for Ethiopians and the curriculum is written by our Ethiopian trainers. It's approved by the Ethiopian Ministry of Education as an official training course and up to now 64 Ethiopian students passed this training course. What we found out and that's the next slide, that solar technician 
or let's say like this, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a man, so I'm neutral, um, and I have to say that the most reliable technicians are the female technicians, the women. Uh, here you can see two of our uh, solar technicians, which is Mena Heilne Michael. She works since 2004 and now has a leading management position in our organization. And the other one is Harek Amare. Um, she joined our work 2008 and is now the leading manager for product, assemb product assembling and quality check. Uh, it shows that this is really a job which can be done easily also for women and women have um, special skill, I guess, special for the customer training, customer service, customer maintenance, which is really very, very important. We are now raising uh, funds to prepare a light version of our training course because six months is very long and, and uh, if we go to other countries then we cannot um, do a six months training. The light version but still includes solar technology and the management. The idea is to have a two weeks training in Ethiopia in our area, in our practical work to the, together with our Ethiopian um, trainers then study the training manual, manual and then um, one or two Ethiopian trainer is uh, traveling to your area, to your home area, to give you a startup support that you can start your solar business in your own country. Um, and after this, of course, there's a permanently um, networking and, and coaching by our Ethiopian experts. Just one slide about what, what we did as well. Um, we did in the past six years also some train the trainer courses for other organizations or for uh, other countries. We, <laughs> we arranged the course for lecturers of uh, Ethiopian uni universities because the universities and the professors and teachers they are very theoretically oriented and they wanted to know um, if the theory and the praxis are close together or not. So um, we, we did an information training, what is needed and how solar energy can work in, in rural areas. Um, we did also several awareness creation for governmental offices. The governmental offices that's one experience, I think, not only in Ethiopia. They need better understanding about solar technology. And uh, I think this is not only the governmental offices, the regional bureaus, but also custom. For example, if, if a custom officer doesn't know what is a solar system, uh, you, you can have several problems by importing the products. We did also courses for Ethiopian microfinance institutions, um, both about the technology and our experience about end-user financing, which we are doing since 2006. And uh, yeah, some uh, technicians from Kenya, Philippines, Tanzania, Malawi already were in Ethiopia and uh, they got a training course. All, all of all, we trained about 450 students or participants. Our equipment in Ethiopia um, are, are three entities. One is, this is our main training area. This is a solar center in Rema, um, which is far away from uh, Addis Ababa. There's a school room and accommodation for 25 students. Because we think if we provide a training about rural electrification, then we shouldn't do this in Addis Ababa in the main capital city. So we should go to rural areas and train the students in these rural areas. We have additionally um, some training facilities in Addis Ababa because sometimes you only have a three days course or you, you invite governmental offices, um, officers um, then it's not possible to, to bring them uh, to rural areas because they won't go. That's why we also have a small training facility in Addis um, and we have a high quality 
test laboratory for panel, batteries, lighting, so we, we can really show um, or explain how to test, how to measure, how to ensure the quality of products. As I said, um, the main training facility is in Rema. Rema is a um, village of about 10,000, 12,000 inhabitants and they got solar energy in 2005. They refused to get a diesel generator from another NGO and um, then we were asked uh, if we can install in every household a solar system and we did it together with support of Good Energies Foundation in, in Switzerland. Um, that's our um, main area where we can test, where we can train students, where we can uh, test products because these people know solar energy and they are very happy about um, the systems. First of all, because it's still running. After seven years, all systems are still running and that's, uh, that's why we are focused on what happens after. What happens after installation? We have to think about maintenance and service. What happens about after, what happens about um, students or what happens after the training? We have to think about startup investment. So we have to, every time if you're doing something, you have to think what happens after. Um, on the right side, down, you see our uh, solar area. I, I, there will come a, a picture, another picture, but first a picture about the landscape and then you really can see that this is uh, very exciting but very rural as well and our technicians who are coming from other areas or from uh, Addis Ababa or uh, bigger cities, when they arrive in Rema, they are crying uh, because they say we are far away from from everything. It's so rural, we can do nothing. And what are we doing here? So they are crying and uh, get homesick. And if they go back after six months, they are crying again because now they are they are a community. They are together. They feel close to these people from Rema. That's why in our experience, the training is not only what the teacher tells the students, it's also, especially in Rema, what the inhabitants tell the students what they need and how, how the interaction, interaction between the customer and uh, our students is. So they are crying again because, because now they are separated in, and um, they have to go in, in several rural solar centers. The next picture shows uh, just um, just it's just a picture of all our Ethiopian technicians which we trained and uh, which are now working in several um, solar centers. We published a small book in 2009, a training handbook for rural solar energy. Mm, it's part of our training course, but this is mainly about the technology. It's not that much about the uh, end user service and the end user finance, which, which should be a handbook we are uh, pr preparing now in, in the next step. So that's what I wanted to say about our work and our experience in Ethiopia. The main thing for me is um, if you do a training, think you have to think about uh, what, what you will do after the training and how you can ensure that the students have a job, that they can start their own solar business and also if you start a training, please consider and keep in mind that solar technology is not everything. You need to train all the, also customer service, end user training and thinking um, how I can serve customers, not only what's the best technology or what's the best technical solution. Thank you very much.
So, uh, hello everyone, this is Vicki Dealey again, and um, I just want to thank uh, Christine, Harold, and Rashinda for these outstanding presentations. They were very interesting, and we've had a lot of uh, nice comments from the audience uh, stating um, that they're very pleased with the presentations and the quality, so thank you uh, very much. Um, and with that, we've reached our time for questions and answers, so um, I encourage the audience if you have questions for any of our panelists to just type those questions into uh, the questions pane function and I'll be happy to present your questions to um, Harold, Christine, and Rishinda. Um, but based on that, I, I do have a, a question that came in specifically for you, Christine. Um, and you may have addressed this in one of your later slides, but can you um, share uh, with us the training materials where those uh, training materials could be found related to the solar diesel hybrid systems? We, um, just to make sure, you, the question is whether we, we have already some uh, material for the uh, hybrid system uh, capacity building. Where can you where where? Can they find it? Yeah, the uh, well, for now, we are, we, are, we are developing all this. Uh, you may have um, seen that uh, among the, the partners of the project, there is the, um, uh, the engineer schools uh, called 2IE, which is based in Ouagadougou, and they are conducting a project on uh, hybrid systems, uh, also with the financing of, uh, of the uh, European Union, and we are developing this with, uh, with them. It's, uh, let's say, it's, uh, it's on process. Uh, it uh, doesn't, uh, we have by EDF also existing uh, materials on this and uh, we are working on the adaptation for the, uh, for the, um, uh, for the needs of, uh, of these countries. We are working with this also very uh, in close cooperation with AMADER because um, AMADER, which is the uh, Rural Electrification Agency of Mali, uh, is now seeing that they developed uh, um, until now they have rules, their access to energy program mainly with a diesel generator and due to the, um, uh, the strong climbing of the prices of, uh, of fuel uh, this lies in the last in the last months and they don't expect this uh, this trend to uh, uh, to be different in the next uh, in the next years they are going to uh, commute very very uh, rapidly and strongly to hybrid systems. So they will need absolutely to have very efficient and very rapidly uh, programs on the hybrid system. So just uh, give us um, uh, a little, uh, well, let's um, a few months more. Uh, we intend to uh, have developed this and to test, to make the first uh, testing uh, uh, sessions uh, this autumn, let's say in uh, September, October. So this is Rachenda, just to add that maybe we can also do, as, as they develop that, we can do a follow-up webinar um, to be able to share uh, those training materials when they are produced. And uh, as soon as we have uh, already tested and uh, evaluated um, uh, curricula, we will, uh, we will load them on the website. Uh, well, you have seen the, uh, the, the address on, the, on one of the slides, and we, you will get the, the address very uh, very easily. Great, thank you. And Rashinda, um, I I love the idea of having a follow-up webinar once the materials are produced. So um, thank you for offering that, and um, we'll talk offline about that later. But I think that's a terrific idea. Um, let's see. A second question comes in from a representative from the Observer Research Foundation in Mumbai, and the uh, question is. Um, they would like to know if there are any plans in the pipeline, so to speak, to conduct, to conduct excuse me, such training programs with partners in India. Hmm. Uh, well, very, very uh, good and interesting questions. Uh, I have not mentioned, and so uh, you give me uh, the opportunity to uh, to tell this now that we have uh, uh, we have signed a partnership, a MOU with the World Bank. Uh, to uh, disseminate and replicate this project in other parts of the world. And uh, so it will be, uh, uh, we, we, we have to organize the, the list of the, the countries where we could, uh, where it would make sense and where it would be uh, 
possible to uh, to replicate this project and uh, um, effectively we have uh, we, we we speak about india so uh, uh, it's a really uh, it's really a, a project we uh, we have to to think about and uh, if uh, indian partners think that it could make sense uh, i think we would be uh, happy to to contribute Terrific, thank you, Christine. Um, Harold, this next question is for you uh, regarding the Ethiopian case. Um, and the question is, what is the cost of the solar kit? Um, and how much does it represent, excuse me, how much does it represent on customer monthly income? And how long is the average finance? So that's really three questions in one. And um, I'm happy to repeat if you'd like. Uh, the solar system we are using is um, not the cheapest one um, because we are f we think the customer should get a risk-free and durable product and uh, unfortunately quality is not a not not cheap so our system in Ethiopia or what we uh, also sell in, in Kenya and Philippines is about uh, 200 US dollar FOB um, and this includes for a starter it's uh, four LED lights and mobile charging and uh, car charger connection to connect other things. Uh, the LEDs, LEDs have a very good brightness of about 120 lumen uh, but only one watt power consumption. So we, what we do is um, we check the household and the income of the household um, and, and see is this a household which could afford this. They have to pay 25% um, at time of installation and then um, the period for the loan is up to three years. Up to three years. Um, mainly the, the end users um, choose a loan for one year then it's already repaid. Great, thank you so much. Um, and and I'm receiving questions very quickly here, so I would like to um, just take a moment to ask um, all of our panelists if we're not able to get to all of the questions that our attendees are asking, would I would you be open to allowing me to send you emails after the webinar to address some of these questions that we might not be able to get um, to due to our time constraints? No, of course, of course. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. Here, uh, the next question is regarding uh, the electrification technology you're using. Um, uh, you know, th your presentation states that you're using solar PV for electrification, but are you considering other technologies such as solar thermal standalone systems and/or wind systems? For for whom is it? For me? Uh, I think this could be for both of you, actually. To address the um, the technology L use, ladies first. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so the, the answer is yes, but um, uh, as you can uh, as you can guess, there is a, a huge work to do, and so we are starting uh, with the most urgent and what is uh, already needed and used uh, on field. So uh, we don't exclude anything, and we would be uh, we will be very happy to work on wind and to mini hydro and so on. But uh, as it is not yet given uh, in the two countries, and it's not the uh, this is are uh, not the technologies used in the two pilot countries we are working with uh, Mali and Burkina, uh, we set this up for a little bit later. But of course, it will be part of the of the project, and uh, of course, any opportunity of working with countries where this these technologies, other technologies are used, would be a, a good motivation for us and a very good opportunity to think about um, elaborating uh, the corresponding uh, curricula. Uh, my answer is very simple, no. Uh, we are focused on solar energy. So we are not experiencing water, wind or whatever and um, we would like to focus on solar because this technology to make it sustainable and durable and, and um, 
do a good customer service for this technology is um, challenging enough for our small power. Okay, thank you both. Um, and, and sorry, if I can just answer, this is Ratenda for the okay. larger, broader practitioner network. We work with all um, approaches and technologies. So as we also discover um, other curricula that may be already in, in use um, in other parts of the world that relate specifically to wind or small hydro, we will be sharing those more broadly with the practitioner network. Great, excellent. Thank you, Rashinda. That's um, very good to know and share. Um, our next question is, again, for you, Harold, uh, regarding microfinance institutions in Ethiopia. Um, and the question is, are there any microfinance institutions in Ethiopia to finance PV systems um, beyond your own microfinance? Um, and if there are not, do you know why that is? If we speak about Ethiopia, we speak about a very interesting country. Um, and, and microfinancing in Ethiopia is a challenge by itself because this country is uh, not really democratic. So uh, the few microfinance institutions which are in Ethiopia mainly are driven or controlled, heavily controlled by the government and so far they don't have that much hard currency that they can do a significant job in, in the solar sector. Some of them are interested but then there's a lack of finance. What we found in, in Kenya and Philippines is that um, MFIs mostly are focused on uh, lanterns still, which is uh, a good start, but not enough, because what we see in both countries, Kenya, Philippines, and also in Ethiopia, is that customers need energy, power, TV, fridges, um, and um, so, uh, solar home systems. And um, it would be great if MFIs start now to think more and more in, in these products as well. The, challenge is it needs more working capital and I guess that's why mostly the MFIs are still focused on small lanterns. Great, thank you. Thank you, Harold, for that great answer. Um, Christine, next question is for you. Um, and the question is, could you tell us how you go about looking at the issue of what comes after um, issues related to work opportunities? Uh, of trainees' use of skills, um, retention in rural areas and operators, and um, there is also the issue of relevant institutions in the in the available environment. So, considering those um, examples of issues, uh, what do you see beyond um, working in that sort of environment? Um, I am not so sure to to, to understand the the, the, question. the main the main question. I think uh, what the requester is asking: What comes after? Um, you know, the trainees have developed these uh, use of work skills. Um, how do you you know retain? Um, these, train, these people that have been trained in the rural areas to continue to uh, work on the system. Um, oh. mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um, what what we intend to do, and uh, this is the main objective of the work. We are starting with uh, with the pilot uh, schools. We have selected, for example, uh, we will uh, not only work with uh, with the schools as they are. We are going to um, to, to to make very close partnerships between these schools and the local operators of rural electrification. And just to come back to the, uh, to the very good point uh, stressed by, uh, by Harad about you don't have only to train people, you have to make sure that afterwards they are able to, uh, to, to make a job out of it. Um, so it's exactly what we intend to do uh, with partnerships between the operators and the local, the rural schools, so that, for example, we open the sessions and the training sessions for people who are then uh, and pupils who are then a, uh, sure that they will get a job 
locally, but uh, maybe also in other regions, in other parts of of the country, if they if they want. Uh, one of the main um, one of the of the uh, also for, of the uh, uh, objectives we we have. Uh, we have is that uh, young people could stay uh, in their village or in the rural areas with a real perspective of developing um, uh, their activities and of getting a good job and of having also a social um, uh, social promotion. So uh, that's why also I mentioned the uh, the, the program we will be uh, starting uh, the communication or the public relation and communication, uh, external communication towards uh, the families, towards the local um, uh, deputies and the respond people in, uh, in charge of the, of the communities because we also have to make, um, well, to give information about what is, uh, what is feasible, what is, pos what is uh, possible. So it's not only uh, training people, and um, I think it's very close to what uh, Harald mentioned in his, uh, uh, in his presentation. It's also working on all the environment uh, of, this, uh, of this training. And uh, this is also when we selected the six, uh, the six schools in Burkina, um, one of the criteria was to be sure that in these areas, uh, the rural electrification policy of the government is progressing quite well and that they are uh, already as a priority uh, zone of, uh, of extension of the programs because then we, we can make we can be sure that uh, this will create a, a good uh, this will boost let's say, let's say the, the, the demand for qualification and qualified uh, people so uh, and little by little when the, the program when the, the program will be extended uh, to the other parts of uh, the other regions, sub-regions of Burkina, we will progress with the, uh, with, the, um, with the schools exactly the same way. The same for Mali, where, as I told previ previously, uh, now we, we know that they will switch to the uh, uh, hybrid uh, systems, so we will uh, first focus on the schools uh, which are close to the regions where they will, well, the Amadeo will implement hybrid systems, so that we know that the people that we, that will be trained on these new technologies are automatically uh, able to uh, to uh, to to use their their new qualification. So it's uh, it's not only the uh, the training in itself; it's also and uh, in this uh, uh, that's that's how I, I now understand the, the question, it corresponds to the, to, the, to the question, it's working also with and for an environment of this training session. Great, thank you so much, Christine. And again, uh, we have many more questions than we have time to answer. Um, and we're coming down to the last few minutes of our webinar. So to those of you who did send questions in, but we don't have time to answer. I will make sure to send these out to our panelists um, so they can respond to you um, through email. Um, so again, apologies for not um, able to accommodate everyone on the phone, but we will make sure your questions are answered. Um, so with that, I think we can now uh, move on to our short survey. And uh, just to let you all know that um, we just want to ask you a little bit about, you know, just three short questions on how we did because your feedback is very important to us to allow us to continue to improve our webinar series and presentations to you. So the first question, um, if you'll just take a couple of seconds, we'll take a couple of seconds to allow you time to answer is, um, was the webinar content provided to you um, uh, was it useful information and provided you with insight? And uh, you can just click on the little radio buttons next to the answers. Um, Okay, oops, thank 
Thank you. Uh, next question, the webinar presenters were effective? Okay, uh, next question please. And our third and final question is overall the webinar met your expectations. Great. Thank you to everyone who participated in our survey. We very much appreciate that. So with that, um, to wrap up on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I'd like to extend a very hearty thank you to Rashenda, Christine, and Harold um, for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us today. Um, you've been outstanding panelists, and um, I can't thank you enough for um, presenting uh, to our audience. I'd also like to say thank you to our attendees for participating in today's webinar. Um, you've been a great audience. Um, we very much appreciate your time, and you have submitted some really terrific questions, um, so we appreciate all of those. And I invite you all to uh, check back to the Solution Center website over the next few weeks if you'd like to view the slides and also listen to a recording, an audio recording of today's presentation. And you can also uh, view and listen to previously held webinars. Additionally, you'll find information on upcoming webinars and other training events. And we also invite you to, again, to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about the Solution Center resources and services, including the no-cost policy support that I mentioned in my um, opening briefing. So with that, I wish you all to have a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solution Center events. This concludes our webinar. <laughs>